Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Paul Earnshaw. I'm conscious that this is the last talk now before you all get on your planes and trains or go to the bar or whatever it happens to be. So I shall try and be brief. Um, uh, okay. I also have um, an apology to make. Um, there is no science in my presentation at all. I'm not a scientist, so I think bisphenol A is mentioned once in there, so you'll have to sort of, uh, your bingo cards won't be as full on that. So, you can tell I'm not a scientist. Packaging is important, hugely important to Tesco. Um, the main message I'm trying to deliver in this talk is that we are passionate about packaging. We are at this event because we want to learn and we want to collaborate and we want to understand what the thinking is. Our minimum position is that we will comply with the legislation, but I'm hearing an awful lot at the moment about where the legislation is and some of the issues we may be facing. So please talk to me, post this meeting, contact me. The contact details appear at the end of here. I'd love to talk to more of you about where this is all going. So that's the main point of it. I'm here to basically learn and listen. You can all switch off now because the rest of the talk is going to basically be a retailer's view of how the, pack how the packaging supply chain works. So that's us looking at the supply chain and what it is. It's the first part. Second part is some of the issues we face with the packaging supply chain. And again, this isn't technical. This is just sort of the the sort of psychology of it and some of the commercial things that come into play that make it interesting as to when we try and talk to packaging suppliers and so on. And then the third part of it is just thinking a little bit about actually packaging safety for our consumers, for our customers, as a more general holistic thing. Today's all been about food contact. I'm going to illustrate it by saying I'm not going to talk about food contact. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about it but just sort of show what's going on in some of the other areas and therefore what we can learn from how food contact, or what we can learn from those areas and apply it back into what food contact needs to, uh, needs to do. So that's the plan, let's get through it. First thing, a little bit about Tesco. Um, people say they've spoken with Tesco, we're a fairly large grocers. They currently employ about 530,000 people in 12 countries around the world. Um, the fact that most interests me about that slide is that we actually have about 75 million shopper visits every week. So if you actually sort of multiply that up by every bit of packaging that they possibly touch as they go through it all, it's about 2 billion pieces of packaging are being touched by the consumer every week. So we have to get it right. It's inexcusable if we do anything that's going to endanger our consumers, our customers, then that's wrong. So this is me sort of acting as a customer of the packaging supply chain and trying to act as the customer's voice, the end customer who's eating the food. So that's Tesco, 530,000 people. People tell me that they've spoken to Tesco. I'd actually say that's a bit like saying you've spoken to Luxembourg. It's a huge organisation. You need to sort of like network your way through and get to the right person. I might not be the right person for you guys to talk to, but I should talk a little bit more about my role. I can act as the person to get you to the person who you ought to be talking to. So that's again another big win for me from coming to this is to make the right connections with the right people. This is my usual rant, packaging. It's a real Cinderella discipline within the industry. If you actually look at where all the sort of the focus is, we focus on recipe development, sourcing lovely tomatoes from Tuscany and things like that. And then we go through all the development of it. And then at the last minute, we go, oh no, we need to put it in something, bung it in a can, bung it in a box, get it on the shelf. That's changing. That is really changing. Packaging is coming so much higher up the agenda in terms of where the company is sitting, both in terms of safety, why we're we here today, because we're interested, um, but also in terms of sort of the consumer proposition and so on. Packaging is vital. Another thing that gets me about packaging is we think, ooh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Another thing about packaging that goes on is that how often does the customer actually touch it? And I don't mean in a food contact way, but I mean in how you actually interact with packaging. You walk into a shop, the first thing you see is the pack. You pick it up, you're touching it, it goes into your basket. You then take it out of your basket onto the counter, uh, I'm sorry, onto the checkout. Then it goes through the checkout into the home, sits in the fridge, sits in the cupboard, whatever, for a bit, and you look at it. You then get it out of the fridge or cupboard, open it, 
And bingo, finally you're actually getting to the food. So why do we always keep focusing on the food and not on the packaging? So it's a real Cinderella discipline. Number of touch points that you do with packaging compared to the food. Packaging covers so many different areas as well, and it's interesting. When you talk with different people, they put a different spin on it as when they're thinking about packaging. It's very difficult to get people to think about all areas of packaging. So, you know, if I'm talking with my marketing colleagues, they're all down at this end. It's all about promotion and selling and things like that, and they're telling me all about what colours they want and all that sort of stuff. Get into the middle here, and I'm starting to talk about you know cost and uh, sort of thing, getting it through the supply chain. How does it display? Have I got the right information on there? So FIR is a big issue with us at the moment that we have to put all of this information onto the label, tiny little print that no one can read. Is it actually delivering to the customer what they need? Debate for another day, but it may be relevant. And then we come down to this left hand end where we have where we are in the room today, which is sort of like actually thinking about protection, preservation, storage, and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, the pack has to deliver across all of that. And that's sort of something we need to keep in mind as we go forward. So, why do we have difficulty engaging with the packaging supply chain? I've been in packaging now for 26 years, and I've built a sort of simple model of how the packaging supply chain works. And this is it. <laughs> now the point is of this is that actually the packaging supply chain is hugely complicated. The number of people that are involved all have an input and so on. It's all really, you know, you know as you've tried to manoeuvre it and so on. What I love about this, it's a brilliant screensaver, it sits as my screensaver. <laughs> what I love about talking to a room like this is that you're all scientists and I bet a good 50% of you are all trying to follow one of those dots through just to see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, you can have this after the, after the presentation if you want, but that's what scientists do. But I love it because actually if you, the dots do follow through and actually what happens and where I feel I sit in this is down here. And I'm this little guy here and look what happens. We finally get the food there, it drops out the bottom of the box through the floor because <laughs> we haven't done it properly. Packaging supply chain. So remember, it is enormously complicated I'm sat down here trying to get stuff going back up the other way and understand what you guys are talking about and do the best we can for our customers. A more simple version. How do we see the supply chain as Tesco? Well, we see it like that. That's it, <coughs> basically. We talk to our packer fillers, our suppliers. They're the ones that we have the relationship with. We talk to them about what we want, what standards we want met, what food to deliver in, what price, blah, 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 blah. That's the packaging supply chain. As a lot of the buyers within Tesco would see it, end of. However, we know that it's actually a lot deeper than that, and a lot of people in this room are part of it as well. So actually, our suppliers are buying primary packaging from people. A few people here in the room, primary pack suppliers. And our primary pack suppliers are actually buying primary materials or machinery or whatever, and so on down the chain. There's lots, I've only put two or three layers in it, but actually, you know, it's right down here. So that's what the packaging supply chain looks like. Remember, we tend to only work at this top level, and I'm going to explain why in a minute and why we might be changing that. So, first thing you get going on is dilution. So if we're briefing out a range or whatever, or we're telling people about we want to do something, we tell it to them once, but it goes out across multiple supplies. Imagine that line is multiplied by a thousand or something all across the way. So any message we have gets diluted. And then we enter into a game of Chinese whispers, where the suppliers that we've told then try and tell the suppliers further down, who then try and tell the suppliers further down, da 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 all the way down the chain. And messages get lost, sign-offs get lost, and so on, and things like that. It all becomes diluted. It's just a problem. That's just the way life works. The packaging supply chain, though, is very interlinked and so on. So one thing you might find is that there's a primary material supplier down here who is actually providing the primary material up to lots of, our pri lots of the primary pack suppliers who are then splitting it off, and it all ends up in Tesco eventually. So it all comes back down. 
I had a, an example of this with, um, if any of you have been in a Tesco and you've seen the finest range, it's all been relaunched recently and it's got lovely silver foil blocking on it. And we've been briefed out that range. Finest is one of the biggest brands in the UK. And we briefed out all of our suppliers saying we wanted it and we wanted this silver foil blocking on it. They went out and briefed all of the primary pack people who got the colour target and they went and took it out and they briefed it all out to their suppliers. There's only about two or three foil block um, manufacturers in the UK and they suddenly received a thousand different requests for the same colour and they just couldn't work out what was going on until after a while they realised what was happening. It was Tesco sitting at the top and it all got spread out, diluted down the chain and it all come back to this poor sod at the bottom going, what the hell's going on? Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we'd spoken to him first off and agreed what we were doing? I think there's some sort of messages within that in what we've been talking a lot about today. Love to get those conversations going about what should we be doing? So, dilution. There's another problem we have as well. In we tend to have, Tesco has quite a robust negotiating style. So when we're talking with suppliers, some information may get lost or whatever. So it might not be as an open a conversation as we would want. I'm not going to say any more about that, but that is recognised. Already mentioned this, scale and, in, um, scale and insight interfaces are going on here as well. That as the message comes down through the supply chain, it's getting lost or distorted or whatever. There's another reason that we have to be careful that we, when we're talking with primary pack material or with, um, sorry, uh, right the way down to primary materials or whatever, there's some legislation in place called the Grocery Supplier Code of Practice. And that's basically there to ensure that the big retailers play fair with the supply base. So if I come down here and start talking with the guys down here and negotiate a price or something like that, which I then <coughs> feed back and then I go to the supplier and say, I've done you a deal, I've got negotiated a, pri a price down here, um, can you buy from that company? I'm not allowed to do that because that's actually setting up a cartel. So I have to be careful about the sort of conversations I have. I can talk, I can talk technical definitely, but other things I have to be a bit nervous of. So if I'm talking with you guys about um, safety and things down here, bear in mind that I have to be fairly open in how I talk about it and what, what sort of things I'm allowed to say or agree to. There's another issue that we have. Um, retail works incredibly fast. Whenever we want to launch a new thing, we have to hit a what we call a, a range review window. We're only allowed to put new stuff into store about every 20 weeks or so because all the shelves are changed. The psychology of that means that the buyers and the technical people tend to be just focused on the next thing that's coming in in 20 weeks' time. The good ones will focus on 40 weeks. The really good ones will be looking at 60 weeks out. But that timescale in terms of some of the stuff we're talking about is really, really short. Good packaging MPD and materials fundamental research and things like that is going to take a long time. And that's an issue that we're recognising and saying we've got different mindsets, we're running fast, other things move at a more steady and controlled pace. How do we actually have a good conversation across those two different speeds? This is less relevant to this, but um, we have a scale problem. I mentioned 530,000 people. Have you spoken to the right person? That's something that's going on. And that's where I come in. So this is a new function that has appeared within Tesco, Food Academy. It's called Food Academy, even though I'm a packaging person. And what do we do? Well, we can talk to anyone in Tesco. I've already mentioned that, that if you want to be networked to the right person, I'm probably a good person to start with. I won't be the person who actually has the conversation with you, but I'll try and find the correct person to have that conversation with. So I can go and talk to anyone within Tesco. I'm not in a silo, so um, big retailers tend to work in categories, so we'll have the frozen team, we'll have the refrigerated team, we'll have the impulse team and so on. I'm not in one of those, so I can sort of like quite happily go across the whole lot. So say we were talking about ink migration in recycled board, that affects all categories. Right, okay, I can go and sort of spread the word about that across everywhere. Bearing in mind the caveats that I uh, said about um, grocery supplier code of practice, 
I'm allowed to walk up and down the supply chain. I've spent 26 years doing packaging development, so I'm quite happy to have the conversations with all of you guys and all the primary packaging people and so on and understand what's going on and sort of like try and play nice, basically. Sort of like understand that an NPD process is going to take you two years and actually the sort of 20 weeks hard negotiation type cycle won't work. So when we come to talking about safety and things, I can have that conversation. We want to get outside of the um, existing industry, as it were. Really want to start talking to academia, really want to start talking to the trade organisations. That's why I'm here today. Understand what is actually going on, what is driving all of this sort of stuff. So we see the legislation, we comply with the legislation. What are the drivers behind it? Where's it going next? Where could we actually apply possibly some of our pull to this? So legislation is a, in my head, a slightly negative thing. It's a big stick to hit people with to make sure they do what they're meant to do. If we can do it as well from our side, and actually you can follow the money then, and we can get some good changes going through, that will be brilliant. So again, this is where I want to have conversations with you guys about where do you actually think the science is going to take us? What should we be doing? Um, Conrad mentioned about sort of pra pragmatic sort of developments and things like that. That's the world I'm definitely in. I've got to be pragmatic about it. I've got to make it make business sense. But that doesn't. But business sense, if we can align that with where the science is, we're all going to win, and it'll be brilliant. So that was a quick run through of how we actually see the supply chain and some of the difficulties we face. So it's not that we're being difficult, it's some of the sort of the, the structure of it um, actually drives us that way. On to the next area now, which is safety. And actually, packaging safety is a huge issue to us and it's much, much bigger than just food contact. If you actually look at it, we've got the food contact bit, chemicals, taint and odour, foreign bodies, that sort of stuff we're worried about. Injuries, cuts and lacerations, burns, scold, allergens, all that sort of stuff. Child safety, what we're doing on physical properties, flammability, heavy metal and things like that. So when we think about food safe packaging, we're in a much, much wider world. What I'm going to go on and talk about though, is things like accessibility. Now the reason I'm talking about that and not food contact is that this is an area where I know what I'm meant to do because there's legislation in place, it's obvious, I can actually design packs, get packs delivered and meet the requirements. My plea to this sort of organisation is, can we get food contact into the same sort of known space as this? It'd be great if we could, it's much more of a challenge, because it's much more difficult. So there's things like, you know, a 74 year old and a four year old have similar grip strengths. So why, you know, we've got to make sure that the pack works at both ends of the spectrum. Um, how do we actually make sure that our seniors focus, um, can actually pick up the right pack? Do we make the text big enough on it? So I mentioned FIR labels, the ingredients labels. The number of people who can't actually read those is very high. So we have to make the typeface big enough for them. We have to use the correct colours so they can be scanned. Uh, this is just the same point again, so I'm just ranting on about accessibility. And it's a good example of if we get it right, everyone's a winner. So if you had a badly accessible pack, people have to use a tool to get into it. You see people getting the scissors out or stabbing it with knives and things like that. Now, that's bad from two things. One, the customer's annoyed with it. They don't like it. Therefore, I'm losing sales. Two, if they've got to use a tool to do it, the chances are they're going to stab themselves with it or something like that. So I've got to sort of like design packaging away from that. Um, so here's some examples of what we, we should be doing. So again, when we think about food contact, there's lots of deep science, but we've got to abstract that back up to the level where we end up with rules about that people can actually design to and understand. So we need the deep science, but we need it also at a sort of a level that we can do something with. So these are some simple rules that we do around accessibility. And then this is just like people ranting on about different things. So, you know, why do we still have jam jars that people can't get into? 55% of people have had a jam jar that they can't get into. Now, there are solutions appearing around that. There's a special eco cap that's appeared that's easy to open. That's kind of good, but that cap costs twice as much as an ordinary cap and uses twice as much metal. So that's bad commercially, bad environmentally. So now we're working on the next solution, which is sort of 
a Cinderella thing, which is it's not a Cinderella thing, sorry. Yeah. Uh, who's the one with the three bears? I can't remember that one. That was uh, Goldilocks. Yeah, that's a Goldilocks one where I want it just right. So again, we need to do that. So all of these problems are known and we need to do something about them. But they're in that area where I can actually do something about them because we understand them and we've got tools to get around them. Food contact, I need those tools. Give me those tools. Stunning statistic, 2002. How many people had an accident involving packaging? 300,000 people in the UK. Stunning, absolutely stunning. So that's why that's such a huge issue to us. So that brings us on to what we're doing about the rest of it then. So you can see sort of like it's a bigger world that we have to live in where we've got to manage all of these things. So there we are. I, I didn't want to be the only one who didn't have it in there, so I've written bisphenol A into my presentation just as sort of for completeness. And today has been perhaps one of the most useful meetings I've been to all year. Loved it. There's so much I've learned today about where, where we're going, what I should be worried about, what I might not be worried about, what opinions do I need to seek from elsewhere. Superb. Here are some of the things we're worried about, but actually we have people who've got access to all those lists of dangerous chemicals and so on that we work through and we keep a track on it. What actually drives us is the legislation. Now this is an old slide, so don't go and sort of like point out that I haven't got the right bits of legislation on there because it's changing all the time. But imagine we're trying to navigate this and make sure our supply base is um, conforming to all of this and where do we go and so on. So ready reckoners and all that sort of stuff are really, really useful to us. I love being pragmatic about it. What is the right thing to do? Please tell me what is the right thing I should be doing to push back into the packaging industry to say this is where we should be going. Let's get some, let's get some commercial pull going on to actually meet the, um, the safety issues and concerns that we all have rather than just using the legislative big stick. I'd love to know where we should be going. I've reached the end. So, key messages. Packaging does lots and lots and lots of things, and depending on where you sit within the packaging supply chain or where you sit within a business organisation, you have a different focus. But remember, everyone's opinion is being fed into what we have to do. Safety of our customers, critical to us. We have to love our customers, we have to look after them. That's why we're here today, to understand what it is we should be doing. My focus tends to be one year to five years out. So that's why, again, I want to get at the science of what's going on, what I should be focusing on. As a minimum, we'll comply with the legislation. Lots of concerns being raised today about what the legislation actually does. Brilliant, love that, really useful stuff. We want to engage with the packaging supply chain and other organisations to understand and be ahead. So we want to get ahead of this, we want to start pulling it, we don't want to just be reacting to it. That's it, that's me, just remind you how ugly I am, so uh, all done. <laughs>